1992, I married an American woman and moved to Canada. And so, I mean, moved to the United States. Now that I've got my microphone on, maybe my mind will work a little bit better as well. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've lived in the United States since 1992, except for 11 years that my wife and I spent in the United Kingdom, where we established Chosen People Ministries in that country. One of the workers that joined us in that mission in the UK is actually a Russian-speaking Jewish believer who is currently in Berlin helping with the refugee effort, helping Ukrainian Jewish refugees who are seeking shelter. That's one of the things that our ministry is doing at this very uh, unique time in history. Um, in our ministry, we are a ministry that ministers to Jewish people around the globe in every country where there are any significant number of Jewish people, you will find Chosen People Ministries workers. And in the midst of that, we particularly have a strong contingent in the United States, and a lot of our workers are in Israel. We've been doing this ministry since 1894, since a rabbi called Leopold Cohn came to faith in New York and established this ministry. If you would like to um, get our newsletter, I'd like to encourage you to do that. You have brochures that I gave you, and if you sign up for our newsletter, you would get our Chosen People magazine. Of course, it's absolutely free. Our ministry would send that to you. It'll give you information about what's happening in the Jewish world and how you can minister to Jewish people through prayer, or otherwise. You can also get our newsletter by going to chosenpeople.com slash pray for Daniel. If you're watching online, that will help you uh, sign up for this newsletter and get connected to our ministry. I'm the Northwest Regional Director for Chosen People Ministries. I'm heading a soon-to-go live uh, Bible Institute that Chosen People Ministries is developing, and I also minister significantly in, the, in Canada with a fellowship of Jewish believers and non-Jewish believers in the city of Vancouver. So those things, uh, the, either the brochure with its sign-up sheet at the back or online at chosenpeople.com slash pray for Daniel will give you the opportunity to... Um, connect with us in our ministry as we seek to reach Jewish people around the world with the gospel. Now, as a Jewish believer in Jesus, I have since my very earliest days been very aware, as almost all Jewish people are, of anti-Semitism and its effects on the world. As a toddler, even in London, I remember going to Jewish festivals which were put on by a mission to the Jewish people. And in those festivals there would be uh, Jewish people, some believers, some not, who had survived the Holocaust. And there was a heaviness about them. There was definitely an impact on their lives that had absolutely changed their whole being. It was the fruit of anti-Semitism. This evening, we're going to look at the whole issue of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust by beginning, first of all, in the Word of God in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. We'll get there in just a sec. But I wanted to point out, as this slide shows, that this is going to be both a historical, biblical account, but also a personal account. And for many Jews in the world, it is a personal account. For almost all, anti-Semitism is a live issue to this day. 
In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we have the very beginning of the story that sets the stage for what is going on. The real reasons for anti-Semitism that persist from the first century and before even to today. And this is it. This is the Lord saying to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the women, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There is very clearly from the very opening chapters of the scriptures a spiritual war that we are all engaged in to this very day. Those of us who are allied with the seed of the uh, woman, primarily Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, are on the triumphant side that is going to win the side of God. But there is the offspring of the serpent, the offspring of the evil one. And that offspring is in enmity. It is angry. It is hating the seed, the descendant of God and those allied with him. Anyone who lives for God knows what it is to experience the opposition of the world the unbelieving world. Anyone who dares, as we say in England, to stick their head above the parapet and make it known what they stand for in terms of godly values, the world is not happy with that because the world is dominated by an evil one, the offspring of the serpent that is seeking to bring down God's kingdom because Satan seeks to lift himself up over and against the Almighty God. We know the end of the story, but it's a story that is full of pain, and particularly for the Jewish people, because in the book of Deuteronomy, God told the Jewish people, and this is where our ministry gets its name, that I've chosen you from among the nations to make my glory known. God chose a particular people in the world so that his glory might be known to all the world. In other words, God's ultimate objective is that all the world should see his glory. And we read in Isaiah and then again in the book of Philippians that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the ultimate end of the story. But in the midst of this, we're in the middle of a tremendous fight. One of the features of this fight is the anti-Semitism that the world has to this very day. Mark Twain, famous writer um, whom, if you put his quotations into Microsoft Word, Microsoft seeks to correct his English, which is really humorous. But Mark Twain, the famous writer, had actually a love for the Jewish people that came out at certain, in certain of his publications. And he wrote that if the statistics are right, the Jews consist but 1% of the human race. And if I might add, today we are 0.2% of the Jewish race, there are, of the world, of the human race. There are just 15 million Jewish people in the world. It suggests a nebulous dim puff of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be heard of, but he is heard of, has always been heard of, he is as prominent on the planet as any other people, and his commercial importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his bulk. His contributions to the world's list of great names in literature, science, art, 
music, finance, medicine, and abstruse learning are also a way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in this world, in all the ages, and has done it with his hands tied behind him. He could be vain of himself and be excused for it. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, and the Persian rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise and they are gone. Other peoples have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out and they sit in twilight now or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and now is what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew, all other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Now, that was Mark Twain's assessment. There are a couple aspects of this that I would say are not quite right. But the basic story is, how is it that the Jewish people, after 2,000 years of exile and dispersion around the world, are still a viable people, are still alive, and are still prospering in certain areas. It is, he asked the question, what is it? And the answer is very clear. It's an answer that was often recited during the Middle Ages, sometimes in an anti-Semitic way, but other times in a very uh, pro-Semitic way. And basically the idea was, the fact is, the existence of, a, of the Jewish people today despite all that has happened to them, is an aspect of testimony to the Lord and to God, keeping them alive. It's not because Jewish people are better. It's not because we're smarter or because we are more affluent, all of which are actually misconceptions. It's simply because God has kept us alive. Israel could not have survived the War of 1948, the 56-57 War, the Battle of Suez, the War of 1967, the Six-Day War. Israel could not have survived in 1973 to get to the point we are at today when leaders of Arab nations are coming to discuss peace in Jerusalem together and hold summits in the Holy Land that years ago they had said needed to be destroyed. Because God is at work. God's doing something in our world. But the enemy is seeking to oppose. The enemy works through many different means. One of those ways is through believers. In the year 325, so this is about just under 300 years after Yeshua, Jesus has risen to be the Father, to be with the Father, and sit at his right hand. The church was seeking to define itself within the midst of the Roman Empire. And we should understand it, I think, in a sympathetic light, because believers at that time were considered, in a sense, Jews, but they were not given the rights that Jews had because Jews had the right not to worship the emperor. So Christians, because they would not worship the emperor, were being persecuted, whereas Jews were not. So Christians were struggling for their own identity in the Roman Empire that was hostile to them, and they were seeking to differentiate themselves from the Jewish people, also because the Jewish people had had some very bloody revolts against the Roman Empire in the years 70 
115 and 135. Those three wars had turned the mind of the Roman Empire against the Jewish people, and so it wasn't advantageous for Christians, really, to identify themselves by their Jewish roots. So in 325, there was a gathering of all the church leaders, not all, but leading church leaders from around the Roman Empire. And it was held in Nike in Turkey, Nicaea. This is called the Nicene Council. At this time, they chose to deliberately separate their celebration of Passover or Resurrection Sunday from the Jewish calendar. And, but if you read their reasoning, it's, absol- it's actually not that great. They say, we further proclaim to you the good news of the agreement of concerning the Holy Easter that this particular has also has through your prayers been rightly settled so that all our brethren in the East who formerly followed the custom of the Jews are henceforth forth to celebrate the said most sacred feast of Easter at the same time with the Romans and you yourselves and all those who have observed Easter from the beginning. And it goes on to basically say it is not worthy of us to celebrate the Lord's resurrection on the same day as the Jewish people are celebrating uh, the Feast of First Fruits that occurs during Passover, which is actually the day on which the Lord rose from the dead. Happened to be Sunday that week. And that's why in the church today, Easter is on a separate date. Now, I personally believe that... um, God is not that concerned with when the church celebrates the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. And I think you can look in your own hearts and you know that you are worshiping Him. It is an opportunity. And if the date is a different date than on the Jewish calendar, God is still glorified because He looks upon our hearts. That is our God. But nevertheless... The church deliberately was separating itself from the Jewish people. John Chrysostom, who was a famous preacher, who was in the east, um, in the Byzantine side of the Roman Empire, north of, uh, north of Palestine, as it was called at that time by the Romans, basically spoke to his congregation and said, what do you have to do with these miserable fasts and feasts of the Jews. Separate yourself from them. So there was a process of separation going on among the early believers in those early centuries. But that became part of Roman doctrine. As you know, the, main, the church as a whole ended up kind of co-opting the Roman Empire as the Roman Empire kind of faded away. The church kind of continued it in a different way. They called it for many centuries, they called it the Holy Roman Empire. And the Catholic Church was uh, really key in maintaining that. We have the Theodosian Code. We have this emperor called Theodosius, who in the year 404 excluded Jews from some government posts. But a few years later, in 418, he barred Jews from the civil service and from all military positions. In 425, they were excluded from all remaining public offices, both civilian and military. He placed restrictions upon the Jewish people and said, you cannot build new synagogues and you can't repair the old ones. If you go to Islamic lands, in some cases, Um, Over the centuries, this became part of Islamic policy in how to treat the Jews and sometimes the Christians as well. They could not build new buildings. They couldn't repair the old ones. And so many of the ancient synagogues around the world in in, uh, Muslim, typically Arab um, countries, tended to be very decrepit because of these rules. 
That was the Theodosian code that put a lot of restrictions upon the Jewish people and actually also brought to an end the leadership of the Jewish people in Palestine, as it was then called. Things continued to go very difficult in very difficult ways for the Jewish people. By the time we get to the next major turning point, we are at the Crusades. The Crusades had a historical reason. The, um, the Muslim armies were conquering towards and into Europe. They had conquered um, in, in the years before the Crusades. They had actually conquered all of Asia Minor, which is now Turkey and now Islamic. And they were pushing into Europe. And this was the church's push back. There were political reasons as much as religious for this. But Christians were very upset because they were looking at and hearing about all the atrocities being perpetrated upon Christians in the land of Israel and in Jerusalem. They were horrified and they wanted justice. And so they began the Crusades. The Crusades were preached by people like Bernard of Clairvaux, who on one hand said that the Jews are like the apple of God's eye, you cannot touch them. But on the other hand said that they are condemned to suffer, and they should suffer because they, in his view, killed Christ. And so the Crusades went on for a couple hundred years, from 1095 to 1270. It result, they resulted, especially at the beginning, in the eradication of Jewish communities across Europe. Because the Crusaders, many of them peasants, would come into towns, they would see the Jews there, and they would say, we're going to liberate the Holy Land from the infidels, but there are infidels right here, and they would kill the Jews in those towns, or forcibly convert them, or as sometimes happened, the Jews themselves would actually take their own lives rather than suffer that fate. That left an indelible imprint on the Jewish world in Europe at that time. Jewish people were terrified. It basically began a period that lasted for about six or seven hundred years where Jewish people in Europe were constantly moving from town to town, from, to city, from city to city, being expelled from countries. In England, that I know the best because I'm British, in the year 1190, the Jewish people were accused of uh, killing a young boy called William and taking his blood, mixing it with their unleavened bread for Passover. Now, it's ludicrous because what kind of accusation is that? Jews don't even eat blood. That is completely unbiblical and against the laws of God in the books of Moses. Jews would never do that. But these were the allegations made. Jews were attacked throughout the country of England, and in the year 1290, they were expelled, and they were not allowed back in until 13, uh, 1656. And the reason is then there was a Christian ruler in the country who allowed for the readmission of the Jewish people. So the Crusades were a terrible event for the Jewish people. Massacres occurring throughout Europe and sadly right into the land of Israel. When they got to Israel, they rounded all of the Jews in Jerusalem up, put them in a synagogue and lit the synagogue on fire and then marched around singing songs, singing hymns so that they didn't have to listen to the cries of those who were being burned to death. That's a very sad legacy that the Crusaders left to all believers who clearly nowadays would um, disown any, anything like that. But things didn't get better for the Jews. As I said, this, there were these centuries of expulsion from countries and cities the Jewish people really suffered. And of course, 
This brings us to the tragedy and terrible event of the Holocaust. And the Holocaust is a genocide, not the first genocide that has been perpetrated by men upon other men, but certainly the longest lasting, the most organized, the most scientific. IBM actually was instrumental in providing um, Nazi Germany computers whereby they could identify who the Jews were in every city and every town. It was of the longest duration. It killed more people than any other genocide. It was clearly on a racial basis. The only other people in the Holocaust who may um, have been identified purely on a racial basis uh, were possibly the gypsies who also suffered terribly. And there was no political or economic justification for the Holocaust. It was clearly evil in its origins. And to get back to Genesis 3.15, the evil comes into the fact that we know that Hitler and his inner circle were into demonic practices and the like. And so the Holocaust brought great evil upon the Jewish people. This is where I want to maybe get a little personal. Eliyahu, or Elijah, or Elias, he was born in 1934. He's my father. He was born in Kobe, Japan, where his family were running a small import-export business. When the Japanese joined and allied with the Germans, they fled Japan because they knew or feared that Japan would uh, turn on them, just as the Germans had turned on their Jews. They fled to Cairo. In Cairo, the Arab population, not the Coptic population, which is Christian, but the Arab population, which is Muslim, became incredibly um, riled up against the Jews, partly because of the Nazi Nazification of the Arab peoples that was going on at the time, and partly because of how upset they were at, at Jewish immigration to the land of Israel. And so the family stayed in Cairo for a little while, but after they were being found that they were being cursed by Arabs and they fe feared for their lives, they quickly bar mitzvahed, or, or it's kind of confirmation for Jewish boys, their, their two oldest sons, and fled to Bombay. When they were on their way to Bombay, they got delayed in Iraq. And since they were an Iraqi Jewish family, my name Nassim is an Iraqi Jewish name, they were detained in Iraq and actually had to sneak out of Iraq to get the rest of the way to Bombay where they lived out the war. Then my father finished out his high school in Switzerland and finally was able to make it to England after the Second World War was well over around the year 1949. He had a very strange upbringing, moving from city to city. His life was disrupted. The lives of his brothers and sister were disrupted. Fortunately, he was one of those Jewish people who never personally experienced persecution. But nevertheless, he was affected, just as all Jews have been by the Holocaust. The second person I could bring your attention to is Judith. Judith was born in 1933. She says, this is the, I was born in the year that Hitler was uh, elected. When Hitler came to power in 1933, it was only a few short years later that his uh, laws came into effect, the Nuremberg Laws, which were based on the Theodosian Code. It had carried all the way through. It's interesting how this happened. It had carried all the way through until this time. Uh, expelled all Jews from civil and military service. And her father was a civil servant. And there were so many other restrictions 
put upon Jews at that time, that many Jews were committing suicide in Germany, and he was one of them. So she was gravely affected. Today she says, I hope to see him when I go to heaven. She's really looking forward to that because he was a Jewish believer in Jesus. His father died in Hungary. In Budapest, the Jews were, uh, well, hundreds of thousands of them were just outright murdered and thrown into the river in, that runs in between Budapest and, Buda and Pest. But um, he, he died of starvation in the, in the uh, Jewish neighborhood because they rounded all the Jewish people up. They confined them to a small area, and most of them died at that, in, in that situation. She, amazingly, having been born in Berlin in 1933, lived through the Holocaust in Berlin because of a Christian man. And here we see the difference between light and darkness. A Christian man, a German, who said, no matter what um, the cost, I will do what God tells me to do. And so he married my mother's mother. And they dropped their name Zinger, which is a clearly known Jewish name, and took on his last name, Schmidt. But my mother never had legal adoption papers, so it was never trackable. Later, another German person um, deliberately, an official, deliberately tore up my mother's paperwork, which did not prove that she was Aryan, and enabled her to go as under her parents' identity papers, and she was able to go um, survive in part because of that. On another occasion, she gave away her name by mistake, Judith Singer. Judith, by the way, is a very Jewish first name. Most people say Judy nowadays, but Judith is actually from Judah. It's the name Judah, as in the tribe of Judah. That's her name. Yudit Singer was such a clearly Jewish name, and this lady simply came to her mother and said, better be careful, because there are people who would like to harm your daughter. She remembers being hidden in the closet with the door closed when Nazi neighbors came over to visit because they couldn't see her, because they might put two and two together and realize she was Jewish. She was clearly affected by the Holocaust, but miraculously saved. And that's the reason I'm here today, that she survived because of God's grace and God working in certain people's hearts, whether or not they were believers, so that she might survive. But I remember in my early years how she used to have night terrors of darkness in the face of Satan peering down upon her an after effect of having been hidden in closets while Nazi neighbors were in the house. The third person is a relative who is not a believer. He's my wife's father. He's a French Jew. He was born in Paris. His family figured out what was going on early, and they began to flee. As Vichy France became more and more Nazified, they fled further and further, further west towards Spain until they tried to get into Spain over the Pyrenees. That's the mountain range that runs between Spain and France. But they were betrayed by their guides. And so, as a result, he ended up in a concentration camp, not a death camp, but a concentration camp in France, a Nazi camp. It's a miracle that he's alive because the day they arrived, a train had just left for the death camps in Central Europe. He stayed in the camp. They ate bugs to survive. There was no food. They were there for some months. And then finally, the Americans delivered them. But he's a scarred soul. He receives a pension from France because 
They recognized the wrong that was done to them by their Vichy government. But, uh, he, they all, but also more significantly than that, he received a fair bit of counseling at the French government's expense. Trauma counseling because of the effect that it had on him that was so intense that it had a significant effect on my wife's upbringing. And this is all the effect of what happened in the Holocaust. You can imagine how uh, galling it is for us as Jews, <laughs> believers in the truth, <laughs> never the, you know, all the more, to hear people deny that the Holocaust ever happened when we have family members who lived through it, real people. It's sad, but that in itself is a demonstration that anti-Semitism continues to this very day. Anti-Semitism today is really prevalent. It does exist. While Deborah and I were in England, the Labour Party, the Labour are equivalent to the Democrat Party in the U.S., they are the left-leaning uh, party in the country versus the conservatives in England who are the right-leaning party like the Republicans in the U.S. Although both parties are probably more left than the Republicans in the U.S. by far. But nevertheless, um, they elected a leader for their party who was known for anti-Semitism. He was, there were pictures published of him at wreath-laying um, ceremonies for terrorists. There were statements of his that came uh, to light that were clearly anti-Semitic and one that kind of gave a kind of um, maybe humorous twist to it all, was one statement he made once that Jews have no sense of irony, which was a very ironic thing for him to say, because Jews certainly do have a sense of irony. Um, the United Kingdom put up with this guy for quite a few years until finally, a, essentially, a transformation of the Labour Party took place where they began to deal with the anti-Semitism that was in their midst. But clearly, anti-Semitism was very active in British politics for quite a long period. We're seeing the same kind of thing here in the US with certain politicians who've been elected who are saying some things that are quite anti-Semitic and have been on record for it, um, propagating myths misconceptions, and it's something that we need to be aware of because it's certainly a sign that these people are on the wrong side of that equation in Genesis 3.15. The Lord, the Lord of glory, was born in Bethlehem, a Jew, and he's going to come back and he's going to sit on King David's throne in order to do so he has to be a son of King David, right? A descendant of King David. Who's David? But David's of the tribe of Judah. Our Lord has not thrown away his Jewish identity. He's not disowning his heritage, but he's coming to rule the world as a member of the people of Israel. A lot of myths are propagated about the Jewish people still. A lot of people are really concerned about the QAnon uh, myths that were going around the last few years and how similar those are to anti-Semitic um, tropes, I suppose you could say. Anti-Semitism today, while it's real, people really seem to understand you cannot uh, say anti-Semitic things openly about Jews, instead of saying Jews, they say Zionists, and they turn it into an anti-Israel thing. So sometimes you'll see the word Zion and things like that on the internet, and that is an anti-Semitic slur. Uh, 
because typically they say they are talking about Jews, but in reality, uh, about Israel, but in reality, they mean all Jews, although they wouldn't admit it. Another sign of anti-Semitism is a singling out of Israel from all the nations of the world. Do you know that a, a, a huge proportion of all the condemnations of states in the world, in the United Nations, are directed against Israel. It's very strange because Israel's a democratic country and while Israel receives dozens of, of condemnations, countries like North Korea and Saudi Arabia that oppresses people and, and other countries where there are terrible human rights abuses, like China with the Uyghurs, those countries get away almost scot-free, a singling out of Israel. That is proof that this spiritual war is still going on because there is one who wants to destroy Israel because Jesus is coming to rule over Israel and with his church rule the entire world. That day is coming when the Lord sits on his throne. Jews are no stranger to being held responsible for all the imagined faults in Israel. And in New York, we continue to see anti-Semitic acts and we continue to see mass shootings from time to time directed against Jewish people. I think it's worth mentioning just some of the more recent ones. Maybe you weren't aware of this. In on January 15th, I think maybe this one is more recent, you might be aware, but in Colleyville in Texas, a gunman entered Congregation Beth Israel Synagogue. He was let in by the rabbi who had pity on him, obviously not a Jewish man, but he, someone who claimed he was in need. So the rabbi, just as a pastor might do, um, invited this person in and gave him something to eat and drink and tried to help this person. There was a live stream in the, in the synagogue at that time, at the service, and it captured some of the gunman's words. The gunman took four hostages and included the synagogue's rabbi, who was the one who led him in so kindly to him. And there was a 10-hour standoff, and really miraculously, the, um, the police were able to deal with the hostage taker. He was shot to death, and all four hostages escaped and were unharmed. But there was a, a um, terror-based um, attempted murder of Jewish people that was being perpetrated by someone who hated the Jews. This person, in, in the main because of his um, Islamic convictions and his particular type of extremist Islamic convictions. But while that one ended well in 2018, there was the horrific attack in Pittsburgh at Pittsburgh's Tree of Life or Eitz Chaim Synagogue. Congregations were engaged in worship, a shooter came in and murdered 11 people and se wounded several others. And he said very clearly he had wanted to kill Jews. He came there specifically to kill Jews. Now you might understand why if you ever go to a synagogue, you'll notice they have a security system. The door is never opened. It's like going into a, a jewelry store in a high crime part of the city. They look at you on the video before they press a button and let you in. Synagogues typically have that. In the United Kingdom, every Jewish facility has guards outside it. And every Jewish school has barbed wire and guards patrolling outside. And that's the way Jewish people have to live in many parts of the world and even in certain parts of North America. Um, another one in Poway, California, in 2019. You might remember a shooter came along and he, he entered a Chabad house and he shot a 60-year-old woman who was a beloved member of the congregation. 
wounded and shot a number of others. The rabbi actually survived, and he was on TV. I, I trying to remember. I think he may have um, lost the use of one hand or something like that, and and was able to uh, speak to the press the next day. But again, Jewish people being attacked. There are more hate crimes in the U.S. against. Uh, Jews as a religious group than any other religious group. So among religious groups, Jewish people get the majority of hate crimes directed against them. Why is that? Because Jews stand for God's word in people's minds and also because Satan knows that if he can destroy the Jews... He can destroy God's plan because God has a plan for Israel to be regathered from the four corners of the earth, for Israel to, for, for life to be breathed into the bones of the people of Israel and for the nations to see what God has done and just as when God brought Israel out of Egypt to give God the glory. And so lastly, as we come towards the end, the Jewish community has pretty much universally endorsed a statement on anti-Semitism that recently uh, was adopted actually by Iowa as the first state in the USA to adopt this statement as its own personal, as its own state definition. And it says, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property, toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. It's a false perception. In other words, it's not true. It's a lie. We know the end of the story in the book of Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, we read that when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be re released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations. And the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is really going to be the end of the story for anti-Semitism when Jesus brings this to pass and when the end of days comes. God's descendant, the seed of the woman, the Messiah, the anointed one, is going to triumph over the seed of the serpent, the descendant of the serpent. God's will is going to be done. You can bet that the evil one is not looking forward to this outcome and is doing everything he can. That is why Christians of all of all people, out of all religions, are suffering today more than they have ever done in history. And there are more martyrs today than there ever were in the days of the early church. That's the world we're in, because we're in a spiritual war. And that same spiritual war is directed against the Jewish people. The Jewish people who, while they still have not as a whole accepted their Messiah, and that's our mission at Chosen People Ministries, to make our Messiah known, to make disciples among the Jewish people for the Messiah, the King of Israel. The Jewish people, um, too, are an enemy of Satan because both are, in, are key in God's plan to bring about his plan for the salvation of of all nations and the glory of his name. That brings us to the end of what I had to say this e evening, and I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to do so.
And again, if you wish to get our newsletter, chosenpeople.com slash pray for Daniel. And uh, you'll get our newsletter and our prayer letter. So you can engage with us at whatever level you feel right. Thank you and God bless. And thank you and God bless. And, uh, you know, as I was, excuse me, we have uh, aliens moving in. Turn yours off there. Maybe it is off. It was aliens. <laughs> that, the Taos home, that's right. So, uh, you know, as I was uh, thinking there of, of anti-Semitism down through the ages, I, uh, I think uh, the devil came to try to taint all of mankind in the days of uh, the uh, Noah's flood in order to prevent the Messiah from coming. That didn't work. So then the devil came to destroy the Jewish people to present the Messiah, prevent the Messiah from coming. That didn't work. Messiah came. Now, with Messiah here, you might think, well, why does the devil still want to stamp out the Jewish people? God's already delivered through the Jewish people, salvation is of the Jews, and uh, the Messiah has come. I think the reason now is because God still has promises to the Jewish people to fulfill. And if the devil can keep God from fulfilling the promises to the Jewish people, then the devil wins. I, I, I stopped your, your plan right there. And so the devil today still has a very vested interest in seeing that no Jews survive. And, uh, and there's, there's so much anti-Semitism around. Even in uh, uh, the State Department, the United States State Department is... Uh, historically very anti-Semitic, very, they put it in the sense of anti-Israel. Uh, you remember all of the yaka, 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 yaka people, we call them politicians, came along and said, uh, Jerusalem's the capital of Israel, we're going to put the embassy there. But as soon as they became president, not a word heard. Because the State Department, it's called the deep state, God, you know, put it, put it aside, put it aside, put it aside. There was a guy who came along and said, I don't care anything about the swamp. I'm going to move it. And uh, he did. Uh, and it's in Jerusalem today. Uh, but the, the official uh, position of the State Department is that, as Obama used to say it, behind the green line, that's Jew free. Judenrein. No Jews there. That's the official position of the United States government. Um, outside of a few guys that come along. Fortunately, the Congress has been fairly pro-Jewish uh, down through the years, and uh, that's why we always need to check our local representatives and uh, what they care about uh, in those kind of things. That's the only place that probably has kept the U.S. government leaning towards Judaism, uh, towards, towards uh, pro-Israel, uh, rather than uh, the presidency or the State Department, the executive branch. But anyway, the devil would like to make the world Judenrein because if God can never fulfill his promises to the Jewish nation, God loses. The devil wins. That's his plan. So unfortunately, expect more anti-Semitism because the devil is at, uh, at work in the world today. Uh, well, thanks for being here. Those of you online, thanks for being here as well. Uh, chosenpeople.com slash pray for Daniel. Did I get that right? Uh, that is, is the uh, place. There's material uh, back here on the, on the desk there, including a place for you to sign up for the newsletter uh, and uh, other materials that are back there. And Dr. Nassim will be back there as well, taking uh, your, your questions or handshakes, anything you'd like to do. And, uh, and the uh, donation box is back there as well. Again, for those online, if, uh, if you give at tausfbc.org, tonight or at randywhiteministries.org. I'll uh, watch those and make sure that that gets uh, directed towards support of uh, Dr. Nassim. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for, again, the, uh, the, the, the blessing of being able to be here tonight, the blessing of our little church family and its uh, impact around the world. Thank you for one who uh, comes and shares his uh, his, his knowledge, but his family experience as well. And we pray your blessing upon uh, that and that uh, in the end, dear Heavenly Father, we know that one day uh, the Jewish people will 
say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And uh, the Lord will come and fulfill in a day all of his promises to the Jewish people. And uh, our prayer is come quickly, Lord Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. And uh, again, Dr. Nassim will be back there and info back there. Thank you.